Chapter Six of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Six: Mister Gupperduck's Mishap. I've been out all day waiting in queues," remarked Mrs. Bindle complainingly, "and all I got was two candles and a quarter of a pound of margarine." and which are we going to have for breakfast to-morrow inquired bindle cheerfully yes a lot you care retorted mrs bindle coming home regular to your meals and expecting them to be ready and then sitting down and eating a lot you care she repeated what you want to take a lodger for demanded bindle if you can't get food enough for you and me doesn't his money help us pay our way demanded mrs bindle but what's the good of avin more money mrs b if you can't get enough food to go round that's right go on stormed mrs bindle a lot of sympathy i get from you a lot you care about me walking myself off my feet so long as your stomach's full bindle scratched his head in perplexity but forbore to retort instead he hummed mrs bindle's favourite hymn gospel bells look what you done to mr hearty that saturday cried mrs bindle me said bindle cursing himself for reminding her by humming the hymn yes you was the reply he had to go to the police court well it's made his fortune and he got orf replied bindle yes but it might have ruined him you wouldn't have cared and in war time too mrs bindle added well well the war'll be over some day said bindle cheerfully that's what you always say why don't they make peace demanded mrs bindle as if bindle himself were the sole obstacle to the tranquillization of the world mrs bindle sat down with a decisiveness that characterized all of her movements sometimes i wish i was dead she remarked there's nothing but inching and pinching and slaving my fingers to the bone trying to make a shilling go further than it will and yet they won't make peace mrs b remarked bindle you best keep to cookin you're a dab at that and leave politics to them what understands them you can't catch a mad dog by puttin salt on his tail i wonder where old guppy is he continued glancing at the kitchen clock which pointed to half past nine it ain't often he lets prayin get in the way of his meals i hope nothing has happened to him remarked mrs bindle a little anxiously no fear of that replied bindle regretfully things don't happen to men like gupperduck still it's funny him missin a meal he said at a quarter to ten mrs bindle reluctantly acquiesced in bindle's demand for supper she was clearly anxious listening intently for the familiar sound of mr gupperduck's key in the outer door i wonder what could have happened she said as the clock indicated a quarter past ten and she rose to clear away perhaps he's been took up to evan like that cove what artie was talkin about the other night suggested bindle mrs bindle's sniff intimated that she considered such a remark unworthy of her attention ah oh, king richard is hisself again remarked bindle pushing his plate from him throwing himself back in his chair and proceeding to fill his pipe indifferent as to what happened to the lodger mrs bindle busied herself in putting mr gupperduck's supper in the oven to keep warm funny sort of job for a man to take up remarked bindle conversationally as he lighted his pipe preaching at people what only laughs back oh you think so do you snapped mrs bindle i was listening to em one afternoon in regent's park remarked bindle silly sort of lot they seem to me you're nothing but a heathen yourself accused mrs bindle as long as a cove keeps his religion to himself i don't see it matters to nobody what he thinks any more than whether he wears blue or pink pants under his trousers don't be disgusting bindle snapped mrs bindle disgustin what's disgustin talking of what you talked of replied mrs bindle with asperity well i'm blowed said bindle there you angs em on the line and mondays for everybody to see and yet you mustn't talk about em well i'm blowed he repeated what do they say in the park questioned mrs bindle curiously oh they says a lot of things replied bindle personally myself i think the atheists is the funniest there was one cove there what was very thin and very anxious looking said he wouldn't insult his intelligence by believing the things what preachers said so i put a question to him what did you say inquired mrs bindle 
I asks him if he was quite sure he had any intelligence to insult, and that made him laugh. Mrs. Bindle nodded her head in approval. Bindle regarded her in wide-eyed amazement. Never before in the whole of his experience had he known her approve word or action of his. "'Did he say anything else?' queried Mrs. Bindle. "'No, he soon got down, and another cove got up. Then they started a Christian meeting next door, and there was them two lots of people shouting all sorts of things at each other. What God must have thought of it all does me. Why can't they stay at home and pray if they feel as bad as all that?' a day a month at home to blow orf instead of going into regent's park a kicking up a row so as you can't ear the birds sing makes you feel ashamed of being a man it does one chap got up and said he was going to prove there wasn't no god and what did he say asked mrs bindle with interest all he could say was that him and his friends had searched everywhere through what they called the whole physical world and they hadn't found him therefore there wasn't no god they didn't ought to allow it commented mrs bindle indignantly then another cove got up and said he hoped that his friend what had just got down had proved to the whole park that there wasn't no god and if there was anything different would they hold up their hands did anybody hold up their hands asked mrs bindle yes up went my little and like a whiz bang announced bindle mrs bindle gave bindle a look that she usually reserved for mr hearty well sir says he looking at me what is your question well says i will you and your pals come round with me to-morrow morning and try and enlist there was a rare lot of khaki boys round there and didn't they raise a yell that was the end of that meeting every time anyone tried to get up and speak them khaki boys started a ootin and a callin out and avin a rare old time there was one cove what made us laugh fit to die every time one of the atheists started talking he said in a high-pitched voice oh cuthbert don't as if it was a gal what was being squeezed mrs bindle had listened to bindle with the nearest approach to approval that she had ever shown that was another cove there continued bindle warming to his subject funny little feller he was too all cap and overcoat talking about the judgment day awful things he promised us he did made out as if god was worse than an un he said he'd be standing beside god when all the people was judged and he'd tell em how he'd been in regent's park a warning people what was going to happen and no one wouldn't take no notice then we was all going to be sent into a sort of mixed grill and burnt forever nice comforting little cove he was pleasant to live with added bindle dryly why religion can't make you happy without you a-trying to make other people unhappy is what does me when i got a good cigar i don't go waving it in the face of every cove i meet saying ah oh, you ain't got a cigar like this you only got a woodbine don't seem good-natured it don't we've got to save souls remarked mrs bindle with grim decision but didn't a man ought to be good because he wants to be good and not because he's afraid of being bad demanded bindle mrs bindle pondered over this remark for a moment but finding it too deep for her replied you always was a doubter bindle i'd been a happier woman if you hadn't been but continued bindle do you think god wants to have a man in chapel what wants to be at the empire only doesn't go cause he's afraid i wouldn't if i was god he added shaking his head with decision look at artie's horse on saturday nights can't artie drag itself to the stables it can't yet artie's as sure of heaven as i am of you mrs b mrs bindle was silent her manner was distrait she was listening for the sound of mr gupperduck's return i'd give my sugar ration to know what we're all a-goin to do in heaven remarked bindle meditatively fancy artie there what will he do they won't let him sell vegetables and they'll soon stop him singing we shall all have our occupations remarked mrs bindle oracularly yes but what demanded bindle there ain't no furniture to move and no vegetables to sell all i can do is watch artie and see he doesn't go round pinchin angels meat tickets for once mrs bindle allowed a remark to pass without the inevitable accusation of blasphemy no remarked bindle if i dies and they sends me up to heaven i shall knock at the door and i shall say is artie here artie the fulham and putney greengrocer you know if they says yes then it's a smoker for me and bindle proceeded to recharge his pipe i often thought bindle was interrupted by a loud knocking at the outer door 
with a swift movement mrs bindle rose and passed out of the kitchen bindle listened there was a sound of men's voices in the outer passage with the short sharper tones of mrs bindle a moment later the door opened and two men entered supporting the limp form of mr gupperduck holy angels cried bindle starting up holy angels someone's been a trying to alter him he bent forward to get a better view done it pretty well too he muttered as he gazed at the unprepossessing features of mr gupperduck now accentuated by a black eye a broken lip a contusion on the right cheekbone and one ear covered with blood his collar had disappeared also his hat and spectacles his waistcoat was torn open and various portions were missing from his coat what's he been doin inquired bindle of a weedy-looking man with long hair a sandy pointed beard and a cloth cap three sizes too large for him which rested on the tops of his ears what's he been up to he's been addressing a meeting replied the man in a mournful voice bindle turned once more to mr gupperduck and examined him closely looks as if the meetin's been addressing him don't it he remarked it was not a very successful meeting remarked the other supporter of mr gupperduck a very little man with a very long beard it wasn't a very successful meeting he repeated with conviction well i never seen a meetin make such alterations in a man in all my puff remarked bindle mrs bindle had busied herself in preparing a basin of hot water with which to wash the mud and blood from the victim's pallid face with closed eyes mr gupperduck continued to breathe heavily bindle with practical samaritanism went into the parlour and returned with a half quartern bottle pouring some of the contents into a glass he held it to mr gupperduck's lips without the least resistance the liquid was swallowed took that down pretty clean said bindle looking up at the man with the sandy beard don't do that cried mrs bindle turning suddenly her nostrils detecting the smell of alcohol do what inquired bindle from where he knelt beside the damaged mr gupperduck give him that said mrs bindle he's temperance well he ain't now remarked bindle with calm conviction oh you villain the vindictiveness of mrs bindle's tone caused the three listeners to look up and even mr gupperduck's eyelids after a preliminary flutter raised themselves as he gazed about him wonderingly where am i he moaned you're all right said mrs bindle taking bindle's place by mr gupperduck's side you're safe now mr gupperduck closed his eyes again and mrs bindle proceeded to wipe his face with a piece of flannel dipped in water poor old guppy murmured bindle they done it in style anyhow i wonder what he's been up to must have been saying things what they didn't like what was he talking about old sport bindle turned to the man with a sandy beard who was sitting on a chair leaning forward with one hand on each knee much as if he were watching a cockfight it was a peace meeting replied the man mournfully bindle gave vent to a prolonged whistle of understanding oh guppy guppy he cried why couldn't you have kept to the next world without getting mixed up with this it was wounded soldiers volunteered the man with the sandy beard wounded soldiers exclaimed bindle yes continued the man mournfully he appealed to them as sufferers under this terrible armageddon to pass a resolution condemning the continuance of the war and and they passed their resolution on his face suggested bindle the man nodded it was terrible he said terrible we were afraid they would kill him and where was you while all this was happening oh said the man i was fortunate enough to find a tree bindle looked him up and down with elaborate intentness then having satisfied himself as to every detail of his appearance and apparel he remarked ain't it wonderful what luck some coves do have i regard it as the direct interposition of providence said the man and i suppose you shinned up that tree like giddy o suggested bindle yes said the man i was brought up in the country was you now said bindle well it was lucky for you wasn't it the hand of god was the reply clearly the hand of god sort of boosted you up the tree from behind so as when they'd all gone you could come down and pick up what was left of him that it inquired bindle that's exactly what happened to my friend replied the man with the sandy beard and where did all this happen asked bindle it took place in hyde park replied the man a very rough meeting an extremely rough meeting and he was speaking so well so convincingly he added bindle looked at the man curiously to see if he were really serious but there was no vestige of a smile upon his face 
it's wonderful what a man can do with a crowd remarked bindle oracularly but turning to the inert figure of mr gupperduck it's still more wonderful what a crowd can do with a man bindle mrs bindle's voice rang out authoritatively here am i replied bindle obediently help us lift mr gupperduck on a chair with elaborate care they raised the inert form of mr gupperduck on to a chair his arms fell down limply beside him once he opened his eyes and looked round the room then sighing as if in thankfulness at being amongst friends he closed them again the lord hath given me rest from mine enemies he quoted mrs bindle and the two friends regarded mr gupperduck admiringly seeing that their friend and brother was now in safe hands mr gupperduck's two supporters prepared to withdraw mrs bindle pressed them to have something to eat but this they refused now ain't women funny muttered bindle as mrs bindle left the room to show her visitors to the door she was just complaining that she could only get two candles and a quarter of a pound of margarine and yet she wants them two coves to stay to supper hungry looking pair they was too i suppose it's what she calls hospitality he added seems to me damn silly like a hen fussing over a damaged chick mrs bindle ministered to the requirements of mr gupperduck she fed him with a spoon crooned over and sympathized with him in his misfortune whilst in her heart there was a great anger against those who had raised their hands against so godly a man when he had eventually been half led half carried upstairs by bindle and bindle himself had returned to the kitchen mrs bindle expressed her unambiguous opinion of a country that permitted such an outrage she likened mr gupperduck to those in the scriptures who had been stoned by the multitude she indicated that in the next world there would be a terrible retribution upon those who were responsible for the assault upon mr gupperduck she attacked the coalition government for not providing a more effective police force but protested bindle at length he was asking for it why can't he keep his opinions to himself and not go a-shovin em down other people's throats when they don't like the taste of em if you go trying to shove tripe down the throat of a cove what don't like tripe you're sure to get one in the eye that is if he's bigger than what you are if he's smaller he'll just be sick yet ere are you a complainin because guppy gets himself hurt i don't understand because you haven't got a soul interrupted mrs bindle with conviction well remarked bindle philosophically i'd sooner have a flea than a soul there is flea powder but there ain't no soul powder what i've been able to find and bindle rose yawned and made towards the door end of chapter six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com